Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CRE PN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jay Darren Gross. This is a podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today, my guest is Stephanie Walter. Stephanie is a capital raiser, a syndicator, and the CEO of Airbay Wealth. She recently retired and sold her insurance agency of 16 years by following the key principles she's learned from her wealthy investors. And in just a minute, we're gonna speak with Stephanie about how to unlearn what we've been wired to think about money. But first, a quick reminder, if you like our show, CRE PN Radio, there are a couple of things you can do to help us out. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you'd like to see how attractive our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. And you can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Stephanie. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation. Uh, before we get started, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Yeah, I, uh, well, uh, started out of college. I got a job in the insurance industry as a claims adjuster, actually, um, uh, and uh, worked in that world for about eight years and realized uh that I was uh, got pretty burnt out on um, getting 2% raises every year and um, was ready to do something different. So in 2006, I decided to start an insurance agency and uh, did that, really loved it, loved um, being an entrepreneur and building my own business. Uh, Around that same time, I started investing in single family homes here in Denver. Didn't really have a lot of education with it at all. Just, you know, felt like I had some good ideas of where to buy, where there would probably be some growth in the future. And uh, so made, made those choices along with investing and um, running the insurance agency. And then in 2016, I became pr- I was invited to kind of like a boot camp about um, showing people how to invest in apartment complexes. And uh, I learned about what a syndication was. And uh, once I, I understood how that worked, kind of the, the heavens opened up and the <laughs> light shone, showed through to me. And I just, I, loved the concept. I loved the concept of having a group of people buy a piece of real estate that, you know, no one uh, could do on their own. So just love that concept. So I, I dove real deep into learning the business, um, got uh, joined a program that gives you basically a master's in learning real estate syndication, the ins and outs. Um, Did my first syndication in 2018 by myself, realized I did not like doing that by myself and I would never do it by myself again. Um, So through my network of people, I met uh, my partner and we realized we had, uh, you know, we we aligned on on what we wanted, it, as well as he liked doing things I didn't like doing. So, uh, from there, I began capital raising, and uh, I I loved it. Uh, we're on our seventh deal right now, um, but what I loved the most was getting to know these wealthy investors and kind of realizing that they handled their money a lot differently than I did. Um, so it took until about 2018 where I started following some of these strategies and um, I was able to sell my insurance agency uh, July of this year because my passive income has replaced my working income. And uh, so instead of retiring, I, I do love what I do. And uh, so I, that's why I'm here today to talk about it. <laughs> Got it. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm uh, probably 
as much or more interested uh, than maybe some of our listeners, just based on your background, being in insurance and stuff. And, and um, like you mentioned, seeing the light and, and uh, the passive income uh, that, you know, growing that enough to, to where you were uh, able to uh, step out of the insurance and, and do this uh, full time, or, or actually, I don't know if you even need to work based on, you know, you said your passive income and that. Um, but um, I, I was kind of curious. You mentioned you'd gone to a boot camp. I've I've talked with uh, numerous uh, coaching mentors. I was just kind of curious if you care to share the name of the. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's R E Mentor, and uh, they have a fantastic, um, you know, fantastic program. Uh, really, it is there's a lot to learn and uh, you spend several years just, um, you know, learning a lot and practicing a lot um, because it's a little bit different than single family because one, you're responsible for a bunch of investors money. um, But two, I think you can kind of more wing it with, with single family (laughs) than than you can with, uh, you know, commercial real estate for sure. No, absolutely. Um, so you you did it sounded like you were investing on your own you said you're like uh, kind of no real rhyme or reason you just knew some neighborhoods and kind of picked and were investing if i understood what you said correct uh, and uh how, how many properties did you get up to on your own just doing the, the single family stuff i got about uh i think it was about let's see here uh four properties uh one was a commercial one was uh, a duplex, and then there are two single families in there. Gotcha. Um, it's been a while since I've been to Denver, but um, your timing seems like it was probably spot on as far as just what I've come to understand about the appreciation and the, the marketplace there and and um, For sure. know, the, the growth and, <clears throat> and the affordability issues that come with that. So I'm assuming that 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 uh, treated you well. Are you still in any of those? No, nope. um, just uh, again, when I was started working with the wealthy, I sort of noticed, you know, that my theory was I was just going to hold on to these rentals until they were paid off, you know, and then have my retirement in 20 years. Um, what I, one of the things I learned from the wealthy people was that they just don't let their money sit and not them give them cash flow or not give them you know a good return and so when I realized that in 2018 I started selling all my properties and I just sold my last one um, just a few months ago gotcha gotcha so you're in the is it primarily multifamily is that what you're Mm -hmm. you're investing in now and um I thought I heard you say that you you did try a syndication solo or, or doing one solo before you you uh, ended up getting you know working with your partner was that right? Correct. Yep, I did um one solo project in 2018. Gotcha. And what was that project that you did? That's um it was up in Fort Collins. I still have it. Uh, I was just talking actually to the banker today. Um it's a uh, it's multifamily in the sense that it's a group of people that live in it. So it's a fraternity house of all things oh, wow. up in Fort Collins, Colorado. And um, it's actually been a, a really great investment. Gotcha. And do you, do you collect rent then from the uh, individual um, students or do you just collect rent from the, uh, like from the fraternity and then they, they worry yeah. about collecting from the. They pool it all together and then they send me a check every month. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's, that's definitely a, an interesting uh, thing, but I can imagine depending on, you know, what you, where you bought it at and what the, the uh, market rents are and stuff that that could be a a profitable uh, uh, venture there for you. That's good. Um, So let's talk a little bit about some of the, the, the concepts that you've learned and, and maybe the way to uh, frame this is kind of back up a step and just kind of identify what the concepts or, or the beliefs you had about money uh, before you you interacted with these wealthy investors um, that you, you mentioned. Well, I think the biggest 
you know, it, some of this took a while for me to really understand. I couldn't really put my finger on it. But um, so, but I think to one is a mindset and the mindset is pretty significant. Um, most people in our society look at their money and saving for retirement. Um, they think of accumulating their money. That's, that's really the model that they have. Put it away in their 401k. Don't touch it. Don't uh, really, there's you know, maybe you can, you have a little bit of power of, of what it's invested in, but um, largely if you ask people, they have no idea what kind of fees that are associated with it. But the lar most significant thing is that at the end of that investment, um, we don't know how much money is there because we don't know what the taxes are going to be. And that would be completely, simply uh, not something that a wealthy person would get involved with. And, and that was the first thing that I noticed is that most of the wealthy people I worked with did not have 401ks. Um, they use a model of using their money and uh, I'm calling it utilization, which just means that they don't let their money sit. Their money is working for them at all times um, and working for them in the sense that they are getting cash flow. Cash flow is king to them. Um, so, uh, and when you start to examine that and sort of see how that would work in your own life, is just having more cash flow is going to give you a lot more options as to do I want to be working at this job, you know, 40 hours a week, or, you know, the more cash flow you have, the more options you have as far as what you want to do in your life. No, definitely. Uh, cash flow is king. And as one of my friends is fond of saying, it's the ace. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the uh, definitely the, the one you want. Uh, let me ask you. So um, you, you kind of mentioned even just uh, earlier uh, about uh, kind of your mindset with the, uh, the rentals you had was just to basically pay down the balance, um, you know, and then have this as, as your retirement net. And um, I'm, I'm kind of curious. So for you to shift from uh, that mindset and, you know, having a job or, you know, a business uh, to getting your money to work for you to where you're, you, you basically have passive income that, that has allowed you uh, to, you know, sell your business and, and um, you know, have just enough passive income to, to live on. Um, what, can you describe some of the, the, the shifts there? I mean, was it, was it, I mean, what, what, what I mean, you, you introduced some of these ideas that, to, you know, don't let your money just sit. Um, but can you kind of walk us through what, what you did as far as, you know, some of the steps you took that made it, made it work for you? Yeah. Well, I think one of the other concepts that I should probably tie into that is that if you asked a wealthy person what they felt was most important to them, cash flow or net worth, they would tell you cash flow all day long. And so that's really, that was really my shift in my mind because on paper, I had a great net worth. I had a fantastic net worth, but I didn't have cash flow even close to being able to replace my income. So once I that dawned on me, then I sort of kind of examined each property and that I had and how much equity did I have in, in the property and what I saw my future life looking like. Did I wanna be a landlord forever? Um, I'd already been one for 16 years and I was growing pretty tired of it. Um, but largely there was an enormous amount of equity sitting in those properties. Now you could either take the money out, uh, you know, refinance it if that's possible um, and take the money out and invest it. But my decision honestly was I felt the best place for this money were, was in my own syndications that I was doing with my partner, because what better place to invest um, your money? One, as syndications are amazing in the sense that you're getting paid, um, you know, almost from day one, you're getting paid seven to eight percent interest every month. Um, but our 
syndications, like I said, we're on our seventh one, have been returning over 20% returns um, over the whole period of, of the property, which is, you know, three to five years, that's 20% a year. Um, and like I spoke to one of my wealthy investors and was just talking to him about what I was thinking of doing. And he was like, well, Stephanie, all I can tell you is that if you're getting 20% returns, that, that's something that, you know, you will get wealthy doing. And, um, and so that is what I decided to do. The second part of the other part of the coin on, on that was people think about how they move their money, you know, um, do they do it in a 1031 exchange? Because, uh, you know, tax mitigation is hugely important. What I think is kind of like a, a little secret in this industry is there are so many ways to mitigate your taxes. A lot of people think the only way they can roll their money over is, is, is in a 1031, which we can do for some properties, but many times um, just, you know, uh, what we do is we do a, a cost segregation study. Most people haven't heard of that, or if they do, they don't really understand it to the point of how we use it. We do a cost segregation study on every property we purchase in order to pass what, what that is, is instead of depreciating the property over like uh, 27 years or 39 years, it speeds up the depreciation to where we're um, writing all the depreciation off in one, uh, five, seven years. Um, so it's a, it's amazing strategy for people who have tax liability or don't have tax liability, but it's a, it's a tremendous tool to help you save on your taxes. Um, I might have gone on a tangent there, but I think those are two things that wealthy people definitely address. They A lot of people think that they just address what is the investment making for them. That's definitely, you know, probably half of their concern. Their other half is what kind of tax um, benefits are they going to get out of the investment. And I think that's what most people miss. Um, in our day-to-day -day world, we don't, uh, a lot of people don't think about the tax ramifications. No, I, I think those are all valid, uh, worthy uh, points to make there. Um, I'm kind of curious. So the, the, uh, the path that you were on, you mentioned you had a lot of equity, uh, your net worth was, you know, significant, uh, but the cash flow wasn't there. Um, when you started doing the you know, kind of the syndication and stuff, or the syndications. Um, how long did it take you to, uh, you know, generate more income than what you were making through your um, uh, insurance uh, business and whatever uh, rental income you had? Once I changed that philosophy, I guess, and had had my what I wanted to do, which was to sell my different properties and roll them into different syndications that I had. Um, it was 2018 and is when I started doing that. And I retired in uh, 2021, uh, July years, of 2021. Huh? So as opposed to maybe 20 years that it would have taken um, uh being a landlord and doing all the things I didn't particularly love doing to get to the point to where, you know, that cash flow was coming to me. Oh, I love it. So, so tell me about some of the syndications you've done. You said you, you, you're, have you, you've done seven, you've started seven, where, where are you at in the cycle? How many of you run full cycle? Um, at this point, we haven't, we, we only have one that's run all the way through the cycle um, because we started doing this, let's see, uh, in 2018. Right. Um, and actually one of, there's gonna be several actually in the next probably six to 10 months that will we'll actually finish ahead of schedule. Um, but I can just tell you what um, we do is we look lar largely, we look in Florida, we do multifamily. We look for properties that, um, you know, ha are undervalued. 
So um, we look, a lot of people are like, why can't I, you know, just do this on my own? Well, I can tell you that we, you know, have many connections in Florida. That's where my partner is actually. He has 35 years of being a commercial broker there. So he's established a lot of businesses. And our last two syndications were actually um, off market deals. So deals that never came to market. And the reason that we obviously love those is we really feel strongly that we want to make our money on the buy. Um, we don't want to buy a property and just say, well, we can do this, this, and this to increase the value. We're extremely conservative um, with, with what we do. But yes, we're looking for multifamily uh, properties, a way that we can build up value. And in Florida right now, that's not that hard. <laughs> we've, we've cornered a few markets. We are, we're on our fourth deal in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, we're on our second deal in Cape Coral, Florida. Um, we have some properties in Broward County. Um, but, you know, the Florida, if you look at it and you get um, do any type of research on it, is the, there's just a tremendous amount of growth. I mean, if you listen to any, any news, I, I suppose you'd pick that up pretty quickly, but there's a lot of, um, there's just a tremendous amount of growth in the housing. Uh, there's definitely housing shortages, um, which are causing the rents to just kind of go through the roof. And we're taking advantage of that. So the one property that we're going to be finishing up a cycle on, um, we've only had it for two years and we've already doubled the money of all of our investors. So we're just going to go ahead and sell that one and move on to the next. Well, that's outstanding. <clears throat> um, and is there any kind of a uh, sweet spot? I mean, are you guys going after a hundred unit properties? Or are you going after tens to, you know, twenties or you, tell me a little bit about what you're, what you're going after on these different properties. Well, I, we both, kind of, again, it's, uh, we're very aligned on our philosophy. It just kind of happened that way. I'd love to say that I had a master plan to find someone that we aligned so much, but we both really like the idea of being in control of our deals. And, you know, you, a lot of people come into this space and they go and they buy two and 300 unit complexes. In order to close something like that, you need to be bringing in money from um, what are called family offices. They're just, you know, offices where they're ma managing um, very wealthy families' money. Um, but kind of the deal you make when you work with the, these people is they want to really have their hand in what's going on in the deal. And for my partner and I, we just, we really wanted to grow our investor base just very organically, we both are, you know, extremely concerned with having our clients love working with us and continue want to love working with us. So we started smaller. Um, we started uh, with like, tw you know, 23 units, 35 units, then we're now we're more in the 50 to um, 70 units. And um, so we just have kind of grown organically, which is what we wanted to do. We wanted to uh, be sure that we have a good track record of performance. Plus we can see our, you know, our investors are happy, you know, which is what we want. They refer more um, investors to us. So we're really concerned with building a base of investors that follow us. Um, and so that uh, we just, put under contract uh, 160 unit and that'll be our largest one. Uh, 160? Yeah, 160. Wow. And uh, so, you know, I feel like what we're doing is working because, you know, we have investors that invest again and again, and then they start telling their friends and, you know, on and on. And, and that's what we wanted. Uh, we wanted to, you know, be in charge of our deals at the end of the day. Um, because having the control is, is super important to both of us. Yeah, no, I love the, I love the approach, the, uh, the growth. I was going to ask you, uh, organic, uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, attracting investors, 
uh, you know, especially at the beginning? <laughs> well, it, it's, you know, I could talk hours about that. It's, um, you know, it's, you want there to be one magic bullet. Unfortunately, there just really isn't, you know, I just happen to kind of put it out there to a lot of different people that this is what I'm doing. You get in front of people and some people, most people have never heard of syndication. So it's really trying to educate people to get their mind around the syndication. I was just thinking of it this morning. Our first deal we did happened to be a retail center in Tallahassee. It was the first deal my partner and I worked on together. So we had zero track record. Um, so you had to, you know, really get out and, and sell us as a team and what we wanted to do. And I'm just so, you know, very grateful that it worked that way. But um, I've tried, you know, different marketing things. It, it really just honestly comes down to marketing. But for me, it's um, the relationships I have. I just really um, foster those, you know, I'm meeting a, an investor uh, this afternoon and, you know, you get to know their families and, you know, they, they become a uh, someone who wants to see you succeed and um the best referral best thing we ever get are referrals um but definitely i'm i'm trying to be more active on linkedin and um, um different things like that i've never bought any accredited investor leads um but i've i've done a little bit of everything i even did a uh a direct mail campaign and ended up getting an investor that way which um was was pretty cool but yeah you just kind of have to use the approach of you know just disperse wildly and hopefully you'll you'll catch a few <laughs> but yeah so so let, let me ask you in in that uh, process of uh, attracting investors um how much of it do you do you find your time is educating your uh, prospective investor um as opposed to, you know, gaining their trust and that you're going to be able to execute? Yeah, I think largely for me, it's educating. It, that, that part actually really surprised me when I went into this business, because I think myself, like so many people that get into syndications, people, the people that teach you say, if you find the deal, the money will come. Uh, there's really nothing further from the truth than that. Um, so yeah, it, it, it definitely, it's a little bit of both, but education and creating content, I've really made an effort to create a ton of content on my website and, um, because, you know, it, it is an education process, but I love it because I'm, I am really passionate about it because I just feel like, you know, this is a secret that, you know, the big banks and insurance companies and the wealthy have been take it, taking advantage of for years. And I just want people to know that there's a better way to do things. <laughs> and so it makes it easier and more, it makes it fun for me to talk about this as opposed to insurance, which I love too, but not as much as this. <laughs> I understand. I yeah. Understand. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, so let me ask you, so, uh, we talked a little bit about the investors. It sounds kind of like, you know, kind of a far and wide approach. I'm assuming you started, uh, with the people closest to you, uh, friends and family. Where, did you get any, uh, yes. participation? In that? My, my, my first deal was my friend was my, uh, family, both family, um, and a friend of my family member. It was a little funny because my uh, brother-in-law was really interested in real estate, but he's, you know, really busy sales guy and um, brought him this, this deal with the fraternity house. And he said, you know what, Steph, that's the fraternity I was in when I was in college. I definitely want to invest in that. And then he told his friend, who uh, liked the idea as well. And um, so the I only needed to bring three investors in on that one. But um, yeah, so that, that you know, it's, a, it's definitely a mind shift to have to talk to your family and friends about money. 
Um, but yeah, the, my family has been really supportive, but you know, you, you do have to branch out, you know, and you find that out pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, and I think it, it probably does get, well, it definitely gets easier for us. The more, you know, syndications we have now more of a track record to show to people. Sure. Now, if you've, if you've done it, uh, some of those trust issues would, would, uh, I would think be pretty easy to get past, uh, yeah. knowing that you have some sort of performance or, or a, a record. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the value you've been creating, uh, 20% per an, per year returns or, or impressive period. Um, what are some of the, the strategies or the things that you guys look for, or what, what are some of the ways you've been able to create value? Let's, let's ask it that way. I, yeah, I love commercial real estate for that very reason is, um, is increasing the value of the property by forced depreciation. It's, it's super cool. The, you know, most of us have only heard of, you know, natural appreciation, but in these um, really any type of commercial real estate, but we focus largely on the multifamily. So we found, you know, you find some properties who a lot of people get into this, like, just think of it like going and buying a uh, like a single family home from someone who's been running it on their own. Uh, you can find a lot more ways to be efficient when you go in, when you have the experience and the systems and everything like that. So for us, we knew the market, market is key, like above anything else after watching COVID is market is everything. And we have definitely put a lot of time and effort into finding markets, understanding them, uh, the dynamics that's happening there. So it's not like we just pick a property and say, oh, this will be a nice area. No, we do, you know, probably hundreds of hours of research on that economy and what's happening there. So we want to be sure there's population growth. There's um, going to be uh you know, economic growth coming in, that it's a landlord friendly place to be, um, you know, just, just all of those things. But Tallahassee, I'll just, that one comes straight to mind is what they did years ago is they kind of overbuilt the student housing there. Um, and what ended up happening as a result is there's a real lack of affordable housing for just regular people wanting to live in apartments. And so we took advantage of that. So when I say take advantage of that, we purchased we purchased properties where we knew the current landlords did not have those rents where they needed to be. Uh, you know, if you've ever been a landlord, you know, sometimes you'll just like let the rents keep coming in at, you know, you don't raise the rents like you should. Um, so we go in, we, we find uh, places that need the market rents to be adjusted where they should be, but then there's a whole host of other things we can do to streamline the process. Um, a lot of places uh, do not uh, charge for utilities or if they, they're, they're just very in, in consistent with the way that they do that. That's another way of, of gathering money. There's you know, silly things like pet fees. Uh, a lot of landlords don't charge for that. Uh, I even, this sounds like a weird one, but it's um, something we find is, is trash, trash valet um, services. So any little thing where you can add, you know, uh, a charge for it is going to increase the value of the property. Um, and so the more, the way that commercial real estate is valued is the income minus the expenses is that net income and that determines the value of the property. So if you, you know, are able to streamline the expenses and lower those 10% and increase the, uh, the income, you've just increased the value of that property 20%. So that's, um, you know, working with a team that's really has a strategy on how to maximize those things, um, you know, it is, is that's how we give our, cl our clients those 20% plus returns. Uh, I love that. 
Um, I, I didn't hear you say anything about, you know, remodeling or renovation. It was more, it sounds like it's more operational. Is that typically the, the type of property you've been able to find is something that's just not managed as efficiently or. Yep. Or... Management is the number one thing. You'd be so surprised at how many um, people do not run. These are businesses, you know, at the end of right. the day and they don't run them like a business. And that's, probably the number one way that you can add value into a property. Um, but we do on a few of our properties, we do like small micro re renovations. We're not, we tend to more um, invest in what are called B properties. Properties are, you know, broken out into A, B, and C properties. A properties are, you know, the luxury with the pools and the concierge and all this stuff. B properties are more kind of, you know, the average type of, type of uh, not too old. Um, and, and those are the ones we really like to get into. C's are, they need a lot more work. They're older. They attract a different type of clientele. And what we've noticed, because we, we keep track during recessions, is uh, during a recession, uh, Bs tend to, to do very well because the A people are moving down into the Bs. Um, and that's, uh, that's what we've seen. Uh, our rent collections through COVID stayed at 96%. Um, so that, you know, I think is, is pretty remarkable. Yeah, from what I understand, I mean, I've got clients, uh, insurance clients that I know that are way behind on some collections just based on, you know, the the uh, eviction moratorium and and the, uh, you know, you don't need to pay rent kind of a mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, thing, and those is. would probably be more like tenants found in C, honestly, right. C type of um, the, the bees, they, they have jobs, you know probably mostly professional people. So yeah, so there's lots of different, you know, elements to really think about um, when investing in, in properties. I like it. Um, trying to think here. So the bottom line on this, uh, I think different about money is that you, you, um, you know, you learn from some of your investors, you, you basically kind of put your money to work for you more rather than waiting, waiting to use it kind of thing and, and now your your uh sounds like your cash flow has increased markedly is that fair yeah yeah and i think that you know another myth that people think is they think well you you became wealthy because you invested in really high risk things things i would have never wanted to get involved with and actually nothing could be further from the truth the wealthy people that invest syndications are what historically one of the best places to have your money in the sense that you get above average market returns with um, probably one of the lowest um, amounts of risk that you can have. Um, another thing that I noticed about the wealthy people, especially and this is a, a little timely, is that we're expecting inflation. And uh, wealthy people tend to want to invest in tangible assets, in things that have a value, like a, a building, <laughs> a property. Um, uh, they want to invest in businesses. They want to invest in something that has a value to it. Uh, and especially when we think of inflation, I had to talk in an event a few weeks ago. And just out of curiosity, I came across this fact, which was from 1980 to 2021, on average, the rents have gone up 8.86%. Um, you know, and that's probably a, a number that they, you know, that involves the whole United States. But that's a heck of a number. <laughs> Um, and that does show why these, you know, to put your money in a place like uh, multifamily rents is, is going to be pretty, pretty, not only recession resistant, but definitely a great hedge against inflation. Oh, definitely. I want to ask you, is your uh, raising capital from investors, what kind of criteria do you have for your investors? Is there a minimum or, or uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, we do 
Um, you know, solely right now we're doing 506Cs, which means that we work with accredited investors. And an accredited investor is pretty simple. You don't need, you know, to get a license or anything like that. But all it means is that you qualify to invest based either on your income or your net worth. And for us, the or for the accreditation, you need to, if you're single, make over $200,000 a year. If you're um, married, you need uh, to make over $300,000 a year. If you don't qualify that way, you can also qualify based on your net worth. And that just means that minus your primary residence, you need to have a net worth of a million dollars. And actually, since you said you were in insurance, um, uh, there's actually another way of qualifying. And that's if you have your series 63, uh, six. Um, and I wanna say one more, cause I just kind of found out about this. So um, that's another way that you can qualify um, to, to be an accredited investor. And we usually for, um, require a hundred thousand dollars minimum for the investment got it got it no it's it's uh i love the whole syndication model um it makes a lot of sense and i think the um uh when when you realize that you know these larger properties uh the effort it takes to take one down uh it, it's it's a pretty you know pretty big challenge if you're going to try and do that by yourself so big that it's likely you wouldn't be able to, but um, again, like by pooling uh, resources, you can get to a big enough number. And uh, th the real key to this whole thing, that this is the piece that it's taken me forever to kind of really cement and, and understand this is the bigger the investment you're in, that appreciation applies to the whole investment. And then when you take that, the equity gain you get from where you bought to where you sell, and then you apply that against what your your down payment or the equity you invested in the, the property, it's it, it's like wow, you know, eye popping. As opposed to again, my mindset when I first got in was, well, I bought, I put my money in, and I'm just going to watch the the balance owed to the bank go down, and that's going to be my my equity. And it really is kind of a mind shift because that's that's just not really investing. That's just kind of waiting. Um, you know, it's kind of my mindset when I first started uh, investing, but it is a a really, um, you know, a powerful thing when you realize the, you know, the, the, the idea is to get in as to as big as you can, you know, that you're comfortable with, but that's really where the, the power is, is that because you're leveraged into that and, and how, how much that return on the total is going to improve your investment return on your, you know, the portion you invested. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Hey, Stephanie, if we could, I'd like to shift gears here for a second. Um, as we've mentioned, uh, by day, I'm an insurance uh, broker myself, and uh, I work with clients to assess risk and determine what to do with the risk. And uh, there's three strategies we typically consider. Uh, we look to see if first we can avoid the risk. Uh, when that's not an option, we look to see if we can minimize the risk. And when that's not an option, then we look to see if we can transfer the risk, and that's an insurance policy. And uh, I like to ask my guests if, if they can look at their own situation, uh, could be clients, investors, tenants, the market, uh, government, however you want to, um, you know, I guess paint uh, the, the, uh, the question. Uh, but, it, but if you can take a look at, at your situation and consider what you think is the biggest risk. And um, again, for clarification, uh, while I'm an insurance broker, I, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. Um, so if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, Stephanie Walter, what is the biggest risk? Uh, I think, you know what, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that uh, the biggest risk, uh, if it comes down to people investing in, in syndications is, I guess, really understanding the team of per people that you invest with, um, seeing that they have a track record. Um, I actually have a, um, on my website, of, I think about 30 questions that I get um, from 
almost every investor um, and they involve risk and um, how to mitigate it. And uh, so that's definitely a good, a good, you know, spot to start. Um, I think the largest risk that I've seen personally of, you know, people who have invested in syndications and kind of maybe not done so well um, the last few years, um, I think um, knowing your market or at least um, being with people that really understand the market that they're working in, um, that that I think is huge because, you know, we've seen dramatic differences, like I said, between say a B property, how it's performed through COVID versus a C property, um, as far as rent collections, uh, we've seen differences in the way that, you know, that these properties have done in Florida, as opposed to say Indiana, you know, there's just, there are definite, um, you know, things about these, these different markets that either you need to trust the, you know, team that's bringing you these deals, but these are, they are, there are risks, you know, and uh, doing your due diligence is, is definitely important. No, could not agree more. Hey, Stephanie, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? The best place is my um, website, which is www.erbewealth.com. And uh, yeah, I've got some, like I said, I have a lot of content there. Usually, you know, newer investors will um, download. Uh, we have a new report there that is the five reasons that passive investing might be for you. Uh, but then I mentioned that video uh, series that where I talk about, you know, important questions that you as an investor need to ask um, when you're betting a deal. Awesome. Well, Stephanie, I can't say thanks enough for taking the time to talk today. I've oh, thank uh, you. enjoyed it. I've learned a lot and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. That sounds great. Thank you. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Networks, CREPN Radio.